and thank you to the committee for inviting me to give this talk. I read uh, somewhere that really this talk can be given in one of two ways. One is a detailed description of the speaker's very most latest uh, research, or it can be a more general uh, description of uh, science and explain a number of things, including uh, GI. Lindsay's already done that a uh, little bit, but I really would like to take the second uh, option. And what I'd like to do is to say a little bit about uh, GI and also a little bit uh, about his best student, George Batchelor, who was really very important in the life of myself and many fluid dynamicists uh, later. Then I'd like to tell you something about spreading viscous drops and lava domes from volcanoes and some recent volcanic eruptions. Then I'd like to tell you something about granular flows and then something about uh, chemical gardens. Well, just to summarise GI, and as Lindsay hinted, you could give a whole lecture easily on GI and his uh, work. Let me just say a, a few things. Um, he was the grandson of uh, George Bull, so he was uh, very well uh, connected. His first paper, as Lindsay mentioned uh, in the Cambridge Philosophical Society, was doing some really delicate experiments on like quanta, and he was still an undergraduate when he uh, submitted that and had it uh, published. By 1911, when he was uh, only some 25, 26 uh, years old, uh, he was already appointed a reader in dynamic meteorology, and then in 1923, he was the Royal Society Research Professor in the Cavendish. And he stayed in the Cavendish his whole uh, research life and uh, worked uh, considerably. After the Titanic uh, sinking, uh, a boat, the uh, Scotia, came out uh, to see what situations were like in the oceans and atmospheres uh, that might have been partly responsible for what uh, happened. And GI was the main meteorologist there and made some very important measurements of the vertical distribution of temperature and humidity and as was typical of him, he designed his own instruments to make uh, measurements and, and made uh, conclusions. He understood and contributed enormously to both fluid mechanics and solid mechanics, and in the fluid side, especially to turbulent flows, a situation that unfortunately we still don't totally understand. There's still quite a bit to be done uh, there. Uh, he helped the British uh, during World War uh, I, and then he invented the CQR anchor, as it's called, which I've uh, shown you here, rather than the usual anchor that was uh, used, and had some things like 20 times the uh, holding power. Jai was a keen sailor, and so this seemed a sensible thing for him to do. He was a member of the Manhattan Project, contributed considerably uh, there. He was one at, uh, of 10 people at the first uh, uh, test. Um, and uh, then he uh, worked on deformation of crystalline material. Now, you could give a whole lecture and a fascinating lecture on GI and his work, and you could even give a whole course that's as much as I want to uh, give. I'll just say that uh, George Batchelor, his uh, student, um, wrote a uh, book and the biographical memoirs uh, of the Royal Society. So if you want to learn more about GI, do look at that. I'd like to just say a few words about uh, G.K. Batchelor, his uh, most famous uh, student. Um, this is uh, George on his graduation day with G.I. Taylor, having done a PhD with uh, G.I. George was born in uh, Melbourne, came to Australia just at the end of the war to do a uh, PhD with uh, G.I. He initially came for three years, but he stayed for the whole of his life, uh, died just a week or so after he turned uh, 80. 
In 1959, he uh, set up the Department of Applied uh, Mathematics, uh, which was really quite a courageous thing to do, not an easy uh, matter in the university in those days where almost everybody uh, worked in colleges uh, rather than as George wanted them to work in a building with a laboratory downstairs. And uh, as I've said here in its time, it was the best fluid dynamics group in uh, the world. One of the things George did is he set up uh, the Journal of Fluid Mechanics in May 56. It cost one pound per part, initially, of roughly 100 pages. And now you can't buy it in paper at all. It's only in electronic form. That's the way uh, things have uh, changed. And I might say, having just had to deal with that problem this morning, much, much, much more difficult to submit papers to and submit referees' report before you should just uh, Xerox them and send them in the post. But there it is. Anyhow, so the take-home messages which I want to have after each bit is that they were really, GI and GKB, were really very special, extremely talented uh, scientists. And one could give talks, whole... Uh, uh, sessions on uh, either of them. Well, I'd now like to uh, tell you something about uh, granular collapses and tell you a little bit uh, about uh, theory and uh, some of the lab experiments which I've uh, done. They can be uh, really quite disastrous. Here is an example of a uh, granular collapse, uh, uh, the Aberfan disaster in 1966, uh, where something like uh, 144 people were uh, killed. Well, I'd like to uh, do a little experiment to uh, show you uh, what a granular cap collapse might look like. And you're going to turn this on for me. What I want to do is to get some grains, and these are some suitable grains which I can uh, buy uh, in uh, the supermarket. Put them into this container. You know what, I think I'll first put them into uh, a beaker. That'll do to get them going. Whoops. Put them into uh, this uh, beaker. See that it's got a uniform top. And I hope you can see this. What happens? Well, only part of them move and not very beautifully, and that's partly because <laughs> these rolled oats I haven't uh, used for a while. Um, but what can you look at, at uh, these if you do some experiments? And I had a graduate student do some experiments with a whole series of... Whoops, can I have this? Thank you. A whole series of different uh, grains and... Uh, what he uh, found out is that it didn't matter too much what the form of the grains were. It hasn't gone quite as nicely as I would have liked. Uh, it didn't matter too much what the form of the grains uh, were. It always uh, looked uh, roughly uh, the same uh, amount. So if it holds for all different uh, particles, then... Details of the particles can't be so uh, relevant. Uh, so all that's left is uh, the initial height and the radius, or their dimensionless ratio A. Now, what I'd like to do is to do an experiment where I put some more grains in so you get a better feeling for what happens. And I should stir these grains up so they're more individual grains. We'll add a few more. Mm. Not quite as good as I'd hoped. Whoops. <coughs> well, 
we'll see. Whoops. Now have I got it right now? Yeah. Add some more. Whoops. We'll get rid of those that came out. And now there's a bigger height and they propagate uh, further and reasonably uh, circular. So I said what uh, must uh, happen is that only the dimensionless ratio, the height to the radius must be important and you must be able to put for all of the different uh, particles uh, as you see here you must be able to collapse all the different uh, particles. What you uh, see is that for sufficiently s small aspect ratios the height at the top divided by the radius because this is also uh, non-dimensional follows a straight line, as it must do from dimensional analysis. And also happens here, the change in the radius is divided by the initial radius of the uh, container also follows a, a straight line. And it's only after you've filled it up sufficiently that you can get uh, deviations from uh, that. Well, that's a, a paper that's been recently published or relatively recently in JFM uh, and I won't go into uh, the uh, details um, and say so you could look it up uh, there. This is also uh, true um, if it's two-dimensional in air, two-dimensional in uh, water, if it's a square um, rather than a... Uh, circular uh, uh, body uh, like uh, this and I don't think I'll show the next slides but I'll now say that uh, with some Chinese uh, colleagues I've looked uh, carefully at a number of different uh, situations um, where the particles are all of different sizes and maybe the floor has, is uh, very uh, frictional and it takes things uh, in, and uh, that, that would lead me into details, which I don't uh, really now want to uh, tell you about. What I will say, though, is... Uh, let me see if this uh, works. This, unfortunately, is not quite as granular as I would like it to be. Uh, and what I would normally like whoops, to do is another experiment with a rectangular shape and show you what the difference would be if it is released from a rectangular shape. Unfortunately, I did this experiment uh, in China uh, a few months ago and I seem to have left my... Uh, rectangular uh, uh, container behind. So we'll have to do it with a uh, triangular container and we'll see what difference uh, that uh, makes. Is this being shown? Yeah. So here it's a uh, initially a uh, triangular container and when you lift it up well you see as before some of it stays and doesn't move and you want to know how much that is but the rest of it becomes very circular even though it started as a, uh, a triangular shape. I didn't experiment uh, starting uh, with a rectangular shape and as you oh. Yeah, as you uh, see here, um, with uh, a, a difference of three centimeters of uh, width and ten centimeters centimeters of length, this is what the experiment uh, looked uh, like. And here's the scale, and we could do some simulations of this exact same thing. 
taking uh, the grains into account and the interactions between the uh, grains. And what uh, we found is that the experiment had a width of 23 centimetres and uh, 18 and a half centimetres in this direction compared to the 18 here of the calculation and the 22 of uh, the calculation here. So there's really very good agreement between theory and experiment and it's partly due to the fact that you start with a rectangular shape and there's not uniform motion. It varies with the angle and so it forgets the uh, initial configuration and comes out to uh, be much more uh, circular. Well, this leads to another area of uh, interest, which is what happens if you have from a uh, pyroclastic flow, as it's called, or from a, a volcanic uh, eruption, as happened in Montserrat in 1995, these hot particles, because they're so hot, uh, they travel over the surface of uh, the uh, ocean uh, and slowly fall down. And that's another area that I've inter I'm interested in. I've done some uh, experiments, but I don't quite have the time to talk about them in uh, detail. But the take-home messages uh, from uh, this uh, beginning part is that dimensional analysis is a straightforward way where you can often understand experiments. And dimensional analysis, I've always thought, was very useful, and yet many people in applied mathematics somehow don't seem to be able to use it effectively and well, though it can be a very powerful uh, technique. Uh, we've been able to uh, take into account the effects of friction with the different size uh, grains and different uh, friction coefficients, uh, and we can incorporate that uh, quite uh, uh, straightforwardly. And then the collapse from a rectangular or any shaped uh, container uh, is close to circular if the initial height is sufficiently large. And that's really important because it says that that's what's going to happen. Oh. Only I can see this nice circular shape here, I'm sorry. Uh, that's what's uh, going to happen if you have a uh, uh, granular caps on a uh, flat, uh, uh, horizontal surface, rather. If it's sloped, then, of course, uh, it will go down, and that's uh, another matter that uh, we could uh, talk about. But I want to talk about quite a, a few uh, different things. If we talk now a little bit, uh, if I talk now a little bit about uh, volcanic eruptions, this is a typical uh, volcanic eruption. It's uh, come from this uh, crater here. It first travels up into uh, the atmosphere, expanding as it goes along, and I'll show you a close-up of that in a minute. And then it gets taken by the wind and goes uh, downstream. And so the question is, how far does it uh, go up? Uh, and then how does it go along with the uh, wind? Well, the first part of this really comes to Taylor and Batchelor. In that Batchelor, in the uh, very early uh, 50s, was asked to give a special lecture at the Meteorological Society, and he thought he'd look at plumes that look like this, where you have light fluid gas or liquid, as happens uh, in the laboratory more easily, coming up. And what he, he knew from uh, experiments, that more or less the plume expanded and expanded because it took in fluid from the side. And George knew about uh, dimensional analysis uh, sufficiently to 
know that that meant that the vertical velocity must be proportional to the inflowing velocity that comes in here. The, the turbulent flow here, which would take uh, material in, must be related in uh, this way. But he didn't know what the value of alpha would be, like in all dimensional uh, analysis. Uh, there's this constant of proportionality. And he had two very good students come, um, Bruce Morton from New Zealand and Stuart Turner from Australia. Stuart was an experimentalist. Bruce uh, was a theoretician. So he set them both as their PhDs to look at uh, plumes and the motion of plumes for Stuart to do the experiments and measure alpha and for uh, Bruce to then make uh, evaluations. They'd finished this all, they'd written it up when uh, somehow or other GI heard about it and said, no, 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 I did that in the war. I did uh, lots of things uh, about plumes in the war because we were very interested in lighting fires to lift uh, the fog so that our planes could uh, land. And so the question was that uh, uh, Taylor was particularly interested in, was it better if you only had a certain amount of wood or fuel, was it better to light lots of fires and have many plumes or light one big fire and have just one plume that uh, lifted uh, the fog? And the answer was that uh, it didn't make any difference, that once you got high up enough, it was the total buoyancy that was uh, relevant and that was produced. Anyhow, so uh, Taylor uh, said, I want to have my name on the paper because I looked uh, at this uh, also. And this is a very famous uh, example, uh, Morton, Taylor and Turner, of the taking in of the external fluid by this rising uh, plume, which has lots and lots of applications in civil engineering, in volcanology, etc. An example, which you might uh, like here, was uh, the eruption in 2010 of uh, this Icelandic uh, volcano, which I can never pronounce and definitely never remember. So I just call it E. So this is the 2010 eruption of uh, E. And we knew the strength of the eruption. We, hence, we could calculate how high it went. And we knew what the wind speed was. This was sometime after the eruption. And so we could uh, calculate what the overall pattern, if you like, or the where the volcanic plume will uh, last. It goes like x to the third, again, partly dimensional analysis, partly looking at the diffusion of the turbulent flow outside uh, on this. And these are some uh, ex uh, temperature differences that uh, were shown, or were measured. And the thing that's interesting about that, as you may know or remember, for two or three weeks, there was no airline flight uh, allowed, and people got very upset about that. Now, why was it? Because as you see, uh, the volcanic effects were really confined to a rather small uh, region, but planes were not allowed anywhere. Now, why was that? Well, the reason which is not very well known, but is uh, correct, um, almost all plane engines are leased by the companies, not owned by the companies. So Rolls-Royce, for example, who makes uh, many of the engines, were nervous that uh, there might be some problem because of the volcanic eruption, and so they said, we're not going to allow you to uh, use the uh, engines. It'll mean that you won't pay us for two, three weeks, or they didn't know how much, um, how long. Uh, but uh, we would uh, much rather not risk a uh, plane accident than uh, have uh, something happen. 
So it's a very interesting question of risk. For the airlines, it, uh, the risk was that they lost a lot of money, and some of them even went bust in that uh, time. But uh, for the airline manufacturers, it was a different risk, and they didn't allow it. OK. What I'd now like to uh, do is uh, tell you uh, a little bit uh, about uh, viscous uh, gravity currents. Um, and they happen uh, every day. When you put uh, honey onto toast, it uh, spreads. And I'd like to uh, show you a little demonstration of how this works. Can I have this? Here's some honey. Brand new honey, I've just uh, bought it earlier today. And I'm going to add some and we'll see how it spreads. And I'm very nervous, so you see I'm not putting it on very much in one point, but you already see how axisymmetric is. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit of how you can calculate that. But very quickly, even though it's put on in a non-axisymmetric way, this viscous fluid will spread uh, axisymmetrically. Now, this is known as a uh, gravity current. And that sounds a little strange at first because gravity is downwards, and the motion is at right angles, horizontally. Now, how, do, how does that uh, happen? Well, the reason is that uh, oh, excuse me. there's uh, high pressure in the uh, center and rather low pressure here because it's nowhere near as uh, thick. And a difference in pressure is acted on by gravity, and it's gravity because it's a higher pressure here, and that pushes it uh, along. The pressure gradient there due to the difference in height, and gravity is uh, vertical, and the uh, flow is uh, horizontal. The viscous shear stresses that uh, stop that going, the viscosity of the fluid, and I'll just write down the equations and tell you there's a nonlinear equation in time. And now this is a, just a two dimensional version uh, to make it easier uh, in horizontal coordinate, nonlinear because it's h cubed dh dx. Uh, and then you have to say that the total volume is conserved here. Uh, so this is the expression for the total volume, because you need some other condition to uh, solve this equation. Now, you can, you can solve this uh, by so-called similarity uh, solutions, but a much easier way, approximate way, is to say, look, this says dh dt is something like a, hor uh, a height scale, over a time scale. And that's got to be roughly g over nu, we forget about the three, g over nu, the viscosity, times h to the fourth over the length squared. So that gives me one relationship for h and l as a function of time. And here's another one. Uh, this is the conservation of volume. Very simply, we forget about the two. We just say they're approximately uh, like that. And what that uh, says is that the height goes like the volume in the simple case where I've just got one specific volume over the time to the one-fifth power and the length in this simple two-dimensional representation uh, it goes like time to the one-fifth power with these uh, pre-factors. Uh, um, and 
That is exactly, but in its axisymmetric case, uh, what uh, I solved it properly and got the uh, uh, correct uh, number here. So this is the radius suitably non-dimensionalized of this situation here uh, as a function of uh, time. Uh, and, oh, and this is if there's a constant flux. So imagine that I was constantly putting fluid uh, onto that. Now, I made a mistake here, which I think is uh, fascinating, is that a number of my colleagues didn't really think that I could solve this all properly. And when I went to the lab and did this experiment, but lasting almost a month, after a while, when it was going so uh, well, um, I began to brag a little bit about it. And I'd come to afternoon tea and I'd say, gee, I've just made another measurement and it fits perfectly. And that went on for nearly a month uh, when uh, one afternoon one of my colleagues said, you know, it's interesting, I just feel it's not going to fit well tomorrow. I just have the feeling that there's going to be a, a, a problem. Um, well, I didn't know exactly what he had in mind, but I knew, since he had a key to the lab, that something was going to go wrong. And one of the things he could have done is taken a uh, heater like this. Oh, can I have this? That would have been enough. And then left it alone. And the next morning I would have come and it would have been... <laughs> Totally uh, wrong. So, luckily that doesn't happen in volcanic eruptions. But these same sort of uh, analyses uh, hold uh, for lava domes on Venus. And uh, my friend Dan McKenzie was part of a Venus expedition. And there were these lava domes. And he then presented me with... Uh, this uh, plot, uh, Huppert's viscous theory, I don't know why the end of the theory has uh, gone, and the uh, dots are the measurements that uh, he made, uh, and this is the theoretical uh, calculation. But you see, these are quite extensive uh, pieces of uh, rock, uh, some 30 kilometers uh, um, uh, wide, uh, but it's nothing compared to the biggest volcanic lava dome in the universe, Olympus Mons on Mars, that is something like 625 uh, kilometers in uh, diameter and would have and does have more or less the same uh, shape as uh, I've uh, indicated. As I sometimes like saying, and I can say this here in Britain, this is, would take up almost the whole space of France, uh, really quite uh, extensive. But um, details and why I became interested in this is uh, this is uh, the lava dome that was formed in the sulfur of St. Vincent in this uh, crater. Uh, and this is a, a first an old uh, eruption that gives you the scale. Uh, so there was fluid that came out at some rate here, lava, molten uh, rock, and it spread on this rather flat horizontal uh, crater uh, floor. And the question is uh, whether we could uh, uh, explain what was uh, going on. We measured the uh, volume as a function of... Uh, time and saw how it was uh, being output, uh, increasing with uh, time. We looked at uh, how the shape of it compared with the theoretical shape that I'd calculated properly, solving those uh, equations. And you see there really is quite good uh, agreement. And from that you can work out the viscosity. So totally uh, theoretically, in some sense, you find it's t this is the dynamic viscosity in uh, CGS units 
2 times 10 to the 12th uh, poise. Another way of uh, doing that is to go out into the field. This is my uh, geological colleague, uh, Steve Sparks, uh, making collection on uh, Hawaii where he has uh, an instrument that he pokes into uh, this uh, moving uh, lava with a heat shield to uh, protect himself to measure the uh, viscosity and compare it uh, with my theoretical calculations, which goes quite uh, well. This is far more dangerous than getting the uh, solution of differential equations, but much more fun. <laughs> and I've always been jealous of Steve uh, going to uh, do that. Well, recently there's been uh, another uh, eruption of uh, the Soufriere, um, it was initially axisymmetric and up to a height of about 70 uh, metres. This was uh, just two and a half years ago. And then it was constrained by the crater wall that was in existence before and the previous dome. So it became a rather elliptical shape, which I'll show you in uh, a minute. But we could measure, because we measured the uh, volume, what the extrusion rate uh, was and finally how much uh, uh, came uh, out. Now at first as you see it was rather circular and so I immediately applied uh, my theory and was very happy but then uh, there came a time when it was definitely not actually symmetric uh, and you see here and then we, and I was very unhappy, and I said to Steve, can't you get these volcanic eruptions to behave better? Uh, but then after a while, it became pretty two-dimensional. And so I could uh, pretend that this was a uh, two-dimensional uh, lava flow coming out, just as I showed you in the uh, first uh, slide. And from that, we could... Uh, calculate uh, the uh, viscosity. Well, this is a bit too much de detail. The volume is a function of time, and you see how uh, it uh, went. I think I'll leave uh, this out uh, too. Uh, just leave this last one uh, where we could get a power law fit for once it became uh, relatively two-dimensional, and that told us that the viscosity recently was rather less than uh, the uh, one had been uh, some 20 years uh, previously. And that means that the chemicals that were making up that uh, magma were uh, different. Well, in the last section, what I'd like to do is to tell you something about chemical gardens and talk about whether they're related to the origin of life. And this is some... Uh, very recent work done by a graduate student uh, who I'm helping, am I helping? <laughs> Hindering <laughs> a graduate student who's doing some very interesting uh, experiments and uh, some uh, theory. Now, chemical gardens are really a fascinating, in a sense, partly fluid mechanical uh, problem that have been around for quite a while, as I'll uh, tell you in uh, a moment. Um, and part of the interest is that it brings in biology, physics, chemistry, mathematical uh, modeling. That's the bit that I'm hopefully helping with. Uh, some material science and some interesting geology and geochemistry. The field has uh, became known as chemobryonics, uh, chemistry and basically the introduction to life, if you like, uh, from chemical gardens to chemobryonics, an important paper. An overview that tells you about uh, this is, I'll explain in more detail in a moment, chemical gardens are inorganic precipitates. They're really quite remarkable and I'll show you, maybe I'll show you a photograph first and then come back. Uh, 
These are some chemical gardens that are grown uh, by my graduate student and uh, others. Uh, really quite uh, interesting uh, formations. Um, with cobalt chloride, or that's the easiest uh, chemical to use, but other similar uh, salts, placed in aqueous solutions of sodium silicate, or again, or similar, but these are the uh, um, best in the sense and cobalt silicate gets uh, formed. The cobalt uh, cations react with the uh, silicate and form semi-permeable precipitates which grow into a structure that look like a plant. It's really uh, remarkable. You put these two chemicals together and what we're most used to is when you put two aqueous solutions together, it may get a little cloudy, you might even get a precipitate, but you don't get a growing plant. But that's what you do here, and that's uh, the uh, point. Uh, and what's also interesting is these same systems were found relatively recently at uh, hydrothermal vents at uh, the bottom of the ocean, some four kilometers uh, depth. And there's been some suggestions that life began there at these hydrothermal vents. And so maybe these chemical gardens play some uh, role. Well, to describe what uh, goes on, the idea is uh, you take some cobalt chloride and you squeeze it down into a uh, crystal. You put it into a uh, sodium silicate uh, solution, aqueous uh, solution, and there's, of course, a reaction between uh, the sodium silicate and the uh, cobalt uh, chloride. And the pressure builds up here. And then suddenly, it uh, releases the pressure and drives up these chemical garden plants. So really quite uh, remarkable. The first person who uh, worked on this was the man who's uh, occasionally said to be the first chemical engineer, uh, Johann Glauber, living in the 1600s. Uh, and you see here he's doing some chemistry with a uh, distillery. Um, he was motivated by the 30-year war that played a large role in his uh, life. He was the first to make chemical gardens in 1646. And he wrote about 40 books. Can you imagine in those days before typewriters or uh, laptops or, or, or chat GPT, <laughs> he uh, wrote uh, some 40 books. He was married twice and his second wife had eight children. And as I occasionally say, the chemical engineer, instead of looking at uh, chemical gardens, maybe he should have looked at contraceptives <laughs> and uh, seen how that would uh, do. Newton was also interested, just up the road here, in these chemical gardens, and uh, he played around uh, with them in this room here, uh, and uh, made them. Now, the idea is that one of the ideas of biological uh, life, the origin of uh, life, is that it all came out from outside and grew up in a reasonable uh, way. And I think I'll leave out the next uh, slide. But another possibility is uh, that it really uh, originated from these deep sea vents uh, that were discovered only in 1977. One of the things that I find fascinating is that they were discovered uh, on a small from a small submersible that uh, came out of Woods Hole. Uh, and it had two scientists in the submersible and a captain who uh, sort of maneuvered uh, the submersible. There are questions you could ask, like what if you needed to go outside for a minute? Well, you couldn't. And uh, the scientists who had been there told me that. The other thing that I found fascinating is there are only two scientists uh, in the submersible, and three have told me they were on the first expedition. 
um, interesting. Anyhow, the, uh, these people uh, then uh, worked on this and the chemical gardens were, they su suggested a lab analogy of what goes on at hydrothermal vents. And the important point is that what goes on here has neither sunlight nor oxygen. This is so bright because there's a light shining from uh, the submersible. But they're volcanic uh, fish in the ocean at uh, the deep sea and quite a lot have uh, been uh, found. So that leads one to ask uh, the question, um, did life begin in little ponds, warm little ponds as was suggested by uh, Darwin? or on warm little pores uh, here at the bottom of uh, the ocean? Well, we're nowhere near answering that question yet, but we are able to do some work to analyze the uh, formation of these chemical gardens. There's been quite a lot done, but generally in a beaker, three-dimensional, and a Healy shore cell is uh, very well known in uh, fluid mechanics. And the idea is that it is two plates close together, and that's much easier to uh, analyze. Uh, viscous flow, very well uh, known in fluid mechanics, plates separated by a thin gap and easier to uh, analyze. So what we've, uh, well, I say what we've done what my student has uh, done, and I look over his shoulder in a sense, is uh, make uh, two horizontal, or two plates, parallel plates like this, put in the uh, uh, cobalt chloride, compress it as much as uh, he can, puts it in uh, the bottom uh, there, and then flows over the uh, sodium silicate. Now the advantage of this is that we can analyze it uh, um, theoretically, but this is what you uh, see, that there's a reaction between the compressed cobalt chloride and the outer uh, fluid that really at about this time begins to almost explode. Uh, it grows relatively slowly, and then you see over a very short time it grows quite quickly. We can calculate and uh, measure the uh, effective amount of this inner precipitate, and there's quite a good agreement until we have this uh, sudden pressure, which you uh, see uh, here, it suddenly grows up and uh, develops the uh, nice uh, chemical uh, gardens. This just uh, shows basically uh, what happens, that uh, you have the interior region, it uh, flows in, uh, and then the pressure builds up and throws it uh, out again. So, the take-home uh, messages that I'd like uh, there is that uh, chemical gardens are inorganic precipitates which grow to look just like a plant and we're trying to see quantitatively what they will look like. There's been quite a lot of work, but generally qualitative, behind these phenomenon. They've been cited as relevant cause of, related to, origin of uh, life. They're easily growable in nature, it just takes a while. I would have done that experiment for you also, except that it takes an hour or so for them to uh, grow. Um, and we can uh, analyze them uh, because they follow diffusion control dynamics, which is something that uh, we know quite well. Well, looking at the time, that's about uh, it. And it's time for you all to have a chance to ask questions. Thank you very much for your patience.